Hey, Joe, when was the last time you heard from CJ? I'm not sure. He's been gone for a while, hasn't he? Yeah, I'm starting to worry. I mean, it's freaking February, and he hasn't even taken down that Christmas banner on his blog yet. Nah, I think that's just laziness at this point. Probably, but I'd still like to check in on him. Yeah, the status quo of the series needs to be fixed. Let's go ahead and give him a quick visit. Sweet. How long do you think it's going to take us to get there? Oh, about the time the opening is finished, I should say. Huh? Wow, that was fast. Told ya. Hey, look, there's CJ over there. Hey, CJ. Hey, guys, it's been a while, hasn't it? Oh, knock it off, Steve. You're being a pain in the ass. What, the beard? Oh, don't worry about that. That's temporary. Good, because it looks horrible on you. So what have you been doing all this time? Um, moving. I wasn't lying when I said that in the last review. Well, I'm going to start getting you reviewing crap again. Look, man, I'll get around to it. Just give me a little bit of time to... Nope. I'm putting in this random DVD into your player, and you're going to review it. Alright then. Ariel is kind of a tricky title to talk about. Reason being is that this is a four-episode series that's actually two completely different OVAs that involve the same characters. AKA, there are two very different storylines going on, and both of them have very different things that are wrong with them. But before we even try to tackle the insanity of the story, we're going to have to talk about the characters of this little bit of insanity. The series revolves around three young women and their grandfather being in control of the only mech suit on the planet called Ariel, which is an acronym for All Around Interception and Escort Lady, which is possibly one of the forced acronyms I've ever come across. Rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? Anyhow, the creator of The Last Hope of Humanity is the grandfather who goes by the name of Dr. Kishida. He's your typical mad scientist type. He's always the guy that knows just the right amount of techno babble to get the girls out of any kind of fix, and is very self-centered, and that's really all there is to his character. Then you have the three heroines, Maya, Aya, and Kazumi. Maya isn't exactly Dr. Kishida's granddaughter per se, but she's actually his niece. She's the eldest of the group, so that automatically makes her the most level-headed and noble woman to lead the team into victory. She's more worried about passing her college classes and paying her rent than saving the world. Dr. Keisha bribes her into becoming a part of the team by both paying off her college debts and her rent. Which, I have to admit, being a college student myself, I would instantly take up this offer. And because fighting intergalactic bug monsters would be a far more entertaining way of having to pay off your college debts. 
The only type of character development her character goes through happens in the second storyline of the series, and the only change that she goes through is that she's more willing to take over control of the mech when things go wrong and doesn't need to be bribed into doing it anymore. And the saddest thing about this is that Maya's character is the only character in this entire series who goes through any sort of character arc. Next up on the chopping block is Aya. She's the nerd of the trio. And I don't mean the cute, quiet, sexy nerd that sits in the back corner of the library glancing at the boys from afar type of nerd. No, she's the hard-ass type of nerd, where if she misses a cram section, she's going to go into a hyper-estrogen mode. Her nose is always in a book, because normal people are too stupid to talk to, and she'll be ready to just about kill herself if she doesn't get into the right type of college after high school. These characters bug the shit out of me. I'll admit that when I was in high school, I was a complete and total dork. But at least I knew how to have a good time and when to let loose when I needed to. Now, I will say that it is one thing to have a hard-ass nerd character who's being forced into constantly studying by their parents. Like, you go to for no rain as a random example. But no, she's not getting any sort of pressure from her parents at all. She's forcing herself into this extreme studying lifestyle. The only one who's applying any kind of force onto her is her grandfather, and he's forcing her to pilot a giant robot of death. There are worse things that you could be forced into doing, that's all I'm saying here. Now, I know Japan has this big deal with pressuring their children into doing well in school, sports, and just life in general, but there is zero pressure being applied to this character. She's just being a hard-ass for the sake of being a hard-ass, aka her character can be summed up in three words, she's a bitch. Then, to sweeten the deal, her character remains like this throughout the whole entire four episodes. Although, I will say this, because of her character, we are given one of the more bizarre dream sequences. I don't know what's more frightening, the fact that he was able to graft his head on top of this pink death machine, or the fact that he looks just so comfortable wearing a schoolgirl's uniform. Then the last female hero we have is Kazumi. She's the innocent in the series, and the only one of the three girls who doesn't hate being a pilot of Ariel. She would rather be doing other things, mind you, but at the same time she knows when the world needs to be defended. Kazumi is the only character in this ragtag team that I would have liked if it wasn't for the fact that we spend an entire episode dealing with her boyfriend problems. Yes, in a series that's only four episodes long, it's still able to find a way to cram in a good 40 minutes of meaningless crap. Aside from that, there's almost nothing to her character. She's just the chipper one of the group. By now, you're probably wondering who the villains are in this little piece. Well, believe it or not, I'm not done with the heroes. There's one more hero we have to talk about. This guy. Meet Saber Starblast. He's only in a handful of scenes in this series. He has no character outside of the fact that he has a lightsaber, but yet despite all of this, Saber Starblast is the real hero of this show. Yeah, he's basically Tuxedo Mask. The heroes put up a fight, lose, and, and Saber Starblast shows up to finish killing the monster off to make the heroes look good. While Tuxedo Mask was actually a pretty awesome character, and acts as a love interest for Sailor Moon, Saber Starblast does nothing. I'm not even joking, he has no connections to any of the characters, he's not even a rogue agent for the villain's army, or anything like that, he's just a random mysterious dude from another planet 
that has no connection to the planet that the villains are from, by the way, and he doesn't interact with anyone outside of killing the monster. His character makes the whole entire series just feel disorientating. The three girls pilot Ariel and do all right against the villain, only to have this kill-stealing bastard come in and slay the monster and leave. Oh, and do the characters notice him at all? No, of course not. This guy has less screen time than Matt from Death Note, and yet he's still able to have this giant impact on the series' story. How do you do that? So to finally get into the villains, there are a group of aliens who want to take over the world so that they can use our planet's resources to help their own overpopulated home world. In fact, a large amount of these aliens live aboard of the colony ship, which takes the form of an asteroid which circles around our planet, and that in no way resembles the asteroid base axis from Char's counterattack. But more on that comparison a bit later. The humanoid characters who act as the leaders of this invasion of Earth is this dude named Albert. Yeah, his name is Albert. Not exactly what I would guess an alien would be named, but whatever. Albert's biggest problem isn't so much Ariel, but the fact that his resources on the ship are starting to run incredibly low. So much so that the aliens and all of their wisdom, and I can't make this up, send in an accountant to handle the finances and resources that the ship has left. Yes, it's as stupid and pointless as it sounds. The only reason why this character, whose name is Simone, is introduced along with another character who acts as a stand-in general is to create a love triangle between these three characters. Is it important, or does it affect the characters in any sort of way? No, so I'm not going to waste your time with it. One thing that I'd like to touch on before we go any further is the mech itself. Ariel is by far one of the weirdest designs for a mech I've come across. First off, I really need to point out that this damn thing is wearing a pink leotard and high heels. Not exactly the most combat efficient thing to be wearing on a battlefield. Let's go ahead and put some logic behind the fact that this giant robot is wearing high heels. High heel shoes mostly work because of balance. When a person applies too much pressure onto the heels of the shoe, the heels snap like a twig and you have a completely useless shoe. Now I'm not saying that you couldn't design a high heel to work on this big of a scale and work on the same principles, but still that robot's gotta be freaking heavy. Think about all the times that this machine is just sitting inside of the base. It's gonna be standing and all the weight that's coming from the jet pack, and all these other things are going to be applying towards the heel, and it's going to snap and break. Not only that, but considering all the fast movements that it has to make and everything like that in the heat of battle, it's going to lose its balance really easily. And honestly, don't ask me why I know so much about high heel shoes. It's a longer story than it needs to be. Although one thing that bugs the ever-loving crap out of me is the headpiece. This mech wears a helmet. Why? Is the material used to create the head itself not strong enough to protect the machinery inside of it? If that's the case, you should have just used a stronger material instead of having to make a completely separate unit. Also, why would you even have a visor for protecting the eyes when it's just a freaking machine. The only reason this mech has a helmet in the first place is to hide the fact that this mech has a face, a very detailed one, with hair. Now I personally go by the rule of thumbs that if your mech is going to have hair, its name had better start with Go and end with Gygar. Here, it's just a giant robot wearing a pink ballerina outfit carrying a machine gun with silver hair. It's stupid. Now to be fair, the series does suggest that the design of the mech is based off of Dr. Kashida's late wife, but that's really the only reason. Although if you want to know the biggest insult this mech has to offer, Dr. Kashida has an autopilot mode on Ariel. Yeah, there are scenes that appear once or twice throughout this OVA where the three heroines get snappy and refuse to pilot Ariel, so he just turns on the autopilot and forces the mech to do his bidding. Which raises the question, why do you even need three unreliable pilots if you can just control the damn thing using the autopilot? You know why? Because then you wouldn't have a freaking story!
The last thing I want to bring to everyone's attention is just the insane amount of random things going on throughout this entire movie. You have crazy plot relevant things like the bizarre dream sequence from episode 1, and then in episode 3, Maya has to wear this bunny suit throughout the entirety of the fight. Why is she wearing a bunny suit? Because she was taking a shower before she was picked up for the battle. Why didn't she demand to put on a different set of clothing before she got onto the plane? No reason given. She just gets onto the plane and she remembers that she's only wearing a towel. And the bunny suit is the only suit that's on board for her to wear. Why have bunny outfits become standard military dress attire? Because in this universe, Roy Mustang has prevailed with his miniskirt army and is now training the Flying Bunny Girl Commando units. Yeah, I made it up. <clears throat> Aside from that, you would not believe the insane amount of product placement in this thing. I'm not talking about products that look very close to what products in the real world look like. I'm talking full-on product placement in this thing. You've got red Totoro keychains, a can of Dr. Pepper, an entire McDonald's meal, and my personal favorite, two separate shots of Budweiser cans. Okay, I can understand having one, maybe two product placements in your anime. But why so many? It's like people only do things because they get paid. And that's just really sad. But the weirdest thing about this little movie is something that happens so fast, you might not be able to catch it. In fact, here is the scene. <laughs> Did you see it? Here, I'll slow it down for you. It happens right here. It's a hidden message from the developers. Now, if my sources are to be trusted, this readouts as, We apologize deeply for the unbecoming content found within this work. Wow, this is the first time an anime has actually apologized to me for being a bad anime. So, after all of that, are you ready to get into the storylines of this thing? Well, storyline one is very simple. It's character introductions. Yep, the first two episodes, which clocks in at about an hour, is used solely to introduce the characters and to have the first battle between the two forces. That's it. It's literally, here are your heroes, here are your villains. Now they're fighting each other. Proceed to the next storyline. There's no story going on whatsoever outside of stating who these characters are. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, there are two more episodes left, CJ. Give this one a bit more of a chance. Well, here's the thing about that comment. The first OVA, which has the first two episodes, was released in 1989. The second OVA, which has episodes 3 and 4, didn't get released until 1991, two years later. Can you imagine buying this VHS new and then discovering that the only two episodes on this OVA are solely based on introducing these characters that's whole entire existence can be summarized in one freaking paragraph? And then you have to wait a whole another two years from the next two episodes, and then one episode is entirely filled with filler, and the uh, second episode, oh, okay, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just go ahead and talk about episode three. Episode three, like I mentioned before, is a filler episode that serves no real purpose outside of comic relief. God awful comic relief, but it's comic relief nonetheless. The episode starts out with Kazumi finding a love letter inside of her backpack. The note is a simple time, date, and location, and Kazumi doesn't know if she should go or not considering she has no idea who the love letter is from. Her friends tease her about it until school is over, and when she finally does get home, Kazumi asks Aya to give her some advice, which goes about as well as you would imagine. Time. 
Meanwhile, Albert makes an attempt to do an all-out attack on Japan with all the units that he has left, and in the process, the ship's engine and main power engine generator is destroyed. This is really the only plot-worthy thing that happens in this episode. So because of this, Dr. Kushida has to gather his granddaughters to pilot the aerial to fight the oncoming force. He gets a hold of Maya first, and the whole deal with the bunny suit happens here. Aya reluctantly joins later, along with Kazumi. Then it becomes a race against the clock to defeat these monsters before Kazumi's date starts. So the trio defeats the wave of monsters with seconds to spare for Kazumi's date, and the episode ends on the hilarious note that Kazumi got lost on her way over to the restaurant and missed him. <coughs> episode 4 is where it starts to look like the story was actually leading up to something. We find out that because of Albert's actions in the third episode, the asteroid base is now starting to fall towards the Earth's surface. Due to the massive size of the base, when it lands on Earth's surface, its impact will be powerful enough to cause a nuclear winter and destroy the Earth. If that doesn't ring any bells, then you need to turn in your otaku card, because that is the plot to Mobile Suit Gundam Char's Counterattack. While the reasons and motives behind the asteroid crashing onto the Earth are completely different, this doesn't change the fact that this is a mech series that features a dude crashing an asteroid into the Earth, and it causes the exact same side effects. Also, if you think I'm stretching this possibility of the story ripping off the greatest of the Gundam movies, Char's Counterattack was released in 1988, which is a year before the first OVA of Ariel was released. I'm sure the whole entire thought process of the second OVA's plot was along the lines that Char's Counterattack did so well that they wanted to do a copy of that plot, but make little changes here and there. Hell, the episode comes down to Ariel trying to push the asteroid base outside of Earth's surface, just like how Amuro does the new Gundam in Counterattack. But unlike Counterattack, Ariel fails, and the Earth is destroyed. <laughs> So this is really how we're going to be ending our series. The hero is completely and totally failing and the earth being completely destroyed. You know, I would have thought that at least that that... There he is! <laughs> uh, I shouldn't have expected this series to break away from its formula. But yes, Saber Star Blast throws the asteroid out of range, and the series finally comes to its end with all the characters going about their everyday lives. Although in a nice bit of karma, Aya fails her exams. Serves the bitch right. <laughs> So, that's Ariel. How does it stand? It's so boring you wouldn't even believe. I really had to change my normal formula to make this episode interesting. The characters have this strange ability to suck the life out of every single scene that they're in. The design of the title robot is completely ridiculous, and overall, it's just boring. The story moves at a snail's pace and it turns a two and a half hour flick into an endurance test. What makes this even worse is that this isn't one of those so bad it's funny, it's just straight up bad. Although I have to say it is really nice being able to get back into the groove of things. So I'm going to say I'm going to see you guys next time. This is CJ Hitchcock signing out.
Destruction! There. It is dead. 